good afternoon, and perhaps for some of you, it's good morning. On behalf of the Agency for Healthcare Research and Quality, I'd like to welcome you to our web event entitled Building Health Information Exchanges to Support Accountable Care Organizations and Medical Homes, Delaware's Experience. I'm Judy Consalvo with ARC's Center for Outcomes and Evidence. Uh, we're very excited about today's topic and glad to see that you share our enthusiasm. We have over 700 registered for this event today. Before we begin, I would like to introduce you to our webcast console. The console can be resized to fit your entire browser window. All the components on the console can be resized, moved, and minimized into the menu dock at the bottom of the console. If the slides are too small, click on the lower right-hand corner of the slide window and drag your mouse down to make it larger. Twitter functionality is available in the console for today's webcast. Feel free to participate using the hashtag. A-H-R-Q-I-X. We are pleased to offer closed captioning on this web seminar. To access the closed captioning, please click on the link called Closed Captioning. That is on the lower right-hand side of your screen view. After you click the link, a new window will display the captioning. I would also like to remind you that if you experience any technical problems, you may click on the question mark button at the bottom of the screen to access the help guide or click on the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen to contact us with your question. Our technical staff will work with you to resolve any issues. The last 10 minutes of this web seminar is reserved for a discussion based on questions that you submit. Questions may be submitted at any time during the presentation. Simply click on the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen, then type your question into the Q&A box and select Submit. We welcome your questions and comments on the upcoming presentation, and we look forward to an engaging dialogue that will promote the spread of healthcare innovations. Today's slides are available by clicking on the widget at the bottom of your screen that says Download Slides. This will generate a PDF version of the presentation that you can download and save as desired. The presenter that you will hear from today is an innovator from ARC's Healthcare Innovations Exchange. The exchange includes a profile that provides background on the Delaware Health Information Network that you will be hearing about. For those of you who are new to the Innovations Exchange, I'll take just a minute to give you an overview. ARC created the Innovations Exchange to speed the implementation of new and better ways of delivering health care. The exchange offers busy health professionals and researchers a variety of opportunities to share, learn about, and ultimately adopt evidence-based innovations and tools suitable for a range of healthcare settings and populations. The site includes a searchable database of quality tools and service delivery innovations, and more recently uh, added the policy innovations, such as what you will hear about today. The exchange also contains both successes and attempts, innovators' stories and lessons learned, and expert commentaries. To assist you in implementing these innovations, ARC also supports learning and networking opportunities such as web seminars, tweet chats, and podcasts. We post new content to the website every two weeks on a range of topics and hope that you will sign up to stay connected with us if you have not already done so. We have a number of upcoming web events to share innovative healthcare strategies and promote the spread of innovations. Our next learning and networking event is our upcoming tweet chat called Chats on Change, home-based program for veterans with PTSD. Join us on Twitter on Tuesday, June 18th at noon Eastern for a live tweet chat with Dr. Rebecca Weintraub Brendel, Clinical Director of the Veterans Program at the Red Sox Foundation and Massachusetts General Hospital Home Base Program, and Dr. Benjamin Miller, Assistant Professor in the Department of Family Medicine at the University of Colorado 
Denver School of Medicine. We will discuss how the Boston Red Sox Foundation has teamed with Massachusetts General Hospital to support veterans with PTSD and their families. You can use the ARCIX hashtag to participate in the conversation. Please visit our website for more information at www.innovations.arc.gov. The website also holds an archive of our past web events, podcasts, and tweet chats, and we also invite you to take a look and download some of those materials that may be useful to you in your practice or setting. So now let's turn to our agenda for today. It is my pleasure to introduce our moderator, Dr. Jerry Fairbrother. Dr. Fairbrother is a senior scholar at Academy Health and is an adjunct professor at the George Washington University. She has over 20 years of experience leading health services research and evaluation projects and leads several quality improvement projects. Jerry also serves on the CMS Technical Expert Panel on National Impact Assessment of CMS Quality Measures and on the National Policy Advisory Committee of the National Institute of Children's Healthcare Quality. Jerry? Thank you, Judy. Um, we'll be hearing today from two HIEs, so I'd like to start by providing a little background. Um, HIEs and others, uh, we've seen an enormous growth in technology, spurred in part by the High Tech Act. We've seen increase in electronic health record adoption, and not only mere adoption, but an increase in meaningful use, partly because of the provisions, those provisions that were promulgated to um, ensure technical standards and to um, ensure that quality standards are in place. We've also seen an increase in community-wide technology represented by the Beacon Community Program, also uh, funded through the High Tech Act. And then we've seen a, a growth in health information exchanges at both state and regional level. So <clears throat> the next slide shows the enormous increase in uh, um, adoption of electronic health records in office-based practices. The blue line at the top shows the adoption of any sort of EHR, and as you can see, about 72% of office-based practices have adopted those. The green line represents uh, adoption of EHRs that meet particular standards, and that's lower, but still an impressive growth, and 40% of office-based practices have installed EHRs that do meet um, uh, a set of standards. So the next slide shows the Beacon communities throughout the country. There are 17 of them, uh, again, funded by the High Tech Act to put in place electronic health records community-wide to promote exchange of information in the community and to um, enable monitoring of conditions community-wide. HIEs, though, are key in all these endeavors. To quote a recent article, health effort, the health information exchange is a key driver in efficiency gains. And therefore, these authors say, the success of high-tech hinges in part on whether we can start jumpstart HIEs. So each HIEs are different in different communities. They cover different areas, and they have different sort of locuses of responsibility. Um, there are state-level HIEs represented by Delaware, whom we'll hear from in a moment, is, uh, represents one of these. It's Delaware HIE is linked to other states, but it's a, a Delaware um, HIE. There can be local and regional HIEs um, covering uh, an area within a state or even across states. The HIE in Cincinnati, Ohio. Cincinnati is located in the corner of Ohio, right next to Kentucky and Indiana. So its HIE covers um, the tri-state area of Ohio, Indiana, and Kentucky. There are also regional HIEs in Buffalo and Indiana are also examples of regional HIEs. And then there are market-based approaches, represented by Minnesota, from whom we'll hear in a moment, and Arizona. Um, so at the same time that there's been this explosive growth in technology, there's also been uh, a growth in accountable care organizations. Um, and these accountable care organizations 
need population management at the ACO level, at the ACO system level. They need to have a data warehouse. They need to be able to see, to have a registry function so that they can see, for example, what proportion of their, let's say, diabetic patients have their, HB, have their blood sugar, their HbA1c, in control. So the ACOs need the same kind of functionality that we used to talk about needing uh, at HIEs. Um, they also need to be able to move electronic data uh, around among the entities in the ACOs. And some HIEs have adjusted to become connectors between the ACOs. Others have made other types of uh, adjustments or no adjustments, but in any case, it's a, a perturbation in the system to have uh, this advent of ACOs. So important functionalities of HIEs, and we'll hear about this later, um, include the technology that you need to improve quality, like data exchange, like alerts to let providers know when a patient's gone into the hospital or ED, and like population management. But beyond technology, beyond technology, uh, HIEs need to make a business case in order to, to uh, stay in existence, and they have, there's a need for strong, uh, strong governance structure. Uh, so as David Blumenthal, the former head of ONC said, HIE is dependent on government to change the way care is paid for. Things not related to technology need to happen. Further indication that more than technology is needed to, to uh, make, make HIEs um, workable. So now we'll hear from representatives from two different HIEs, uh, um, the Delaware Health Information Network, um, and then a reaction from uh, Minnesota, represented from Minnesota. We'll hear how they're organized, and then challenges and lessons learned. And you will hear echoes of the challenges um, across the two presentations. So now um, I'd like to uh, introduce our first speaker, Dr. Jan Lee, She'll, who will discuss Delaware Health Information Network. Dr. Lee is the Executive Director of the Delaware Health Information Network, or DIN. Previously, she was Vice President of Knowledge Base and Content for NextGen Healthcare, a vendor of health information technology, products, and services, where she was responsible for development of clinical content in 26 medical specialties for the NextGen electronic health record. She transitioned to a next gen from a 23-year career in the United States Air Force, where she led EHR implementation in 75 facilities throughout the Air Force for the Department of Defense. Dr. Lee? Thank you very much, Jerry. The legislation establishing the Delaware Health Information Network, or DIN, was passed in 1997, and if you think back that far, that was when um, maybe 10 to 15 percent of practices nationwide had EHRs. So it was a very different environment at the time. And a full decade of planning and work went into um, preparing to go live in May of 2007, and I'll tell a little bit more about that preparation on the next slide. We were able to get uh, started with a grant from the Agency for Healthcare Research and Quality under the State and Regional HIE Demonstration Project. And that funding, along with funding from the State of Delaware and private sources, enabled us to contract for a technology solution. And in May of 2007, DIN became operational with data senders and end users in each of Delaware's counties. Over the next several years, we added functionality, added new data senders, grew the user base, and all of that I'll go into in more detail on succeeding slides. But I'm happy to say that today, DIN is an independent, not-for-profit public instrumentality, fully self-sustaining from the services that we provide. So let's get back to that 10-year period of planning between the enabling legislation and the actual go-live. A great many activities and decisions 
uh, were undertaken during that time period. First of all, there's establishing governance, and it definitely needs to represent the, a broad coalition of stakeholders. We had many stakeholder groups who provided input on both the business requirements and the technical requirements. Uh, business requirements, of course, should be the key drivers, and our, uh, our, our stakeholders there helped us to define the must-have data elements for a complete clinical information sharing utility. And then the, plan the planning process included a technical requirements definition com that was completed in August of 2005 and enabled us to go out with an RFP to actually acquire the solution. Now, among the critical questions that need to be answered before you select a technical solution are questions of your patient consent model and your data model. The consent model refers to the consent of the patient for their data to be shared across the network. An opt-in model requires that each patient must individually give consent for their data to be shared before it is exposed on the network whereas an opt-out model assumes that all patient results are in the network unless the patient specifically opts out of allowing their data to be shared. In Delaware, we made the decision to adopt an opt-out patient consent model, but I stress that that was with the input of patients and consumer advocacy groups um, in, in our govern governance process. The other um, major decision is the data model, and that refers to how or even whether the data sent in by multiple organizations is commingled. We adopted a hybrid model, and this involves the, the data in the source systems of the data sending organizations are sent over a secure VPN interface to a data stage in a hosted data center. The fact that it's one hosting data center implies a consolidated model, but the fact that each data sender has their own data stage and that the data is housed separately and never commingled in storage makes it look more like a federated model, and so that's why we say that we've actually got a hybrid. This arrangement in principle allows any member of DIN to withdraw membership if they choose to do that and take their data with them. And that's important because by, by law in Delaware, the data senders retain business ownership of their data. DIN's just the steward, not the owner. And written data use agreements govern how the data may be used, by whom, under what conditions. I think the, uh, the other elements on this screen are self-explanatory. So we'll move on. When, when we did our market survey in Delaware to determine what exchange services the healthcare community would value and use, by an overwhelming majority, the most valued service was electronic results delivery, especially lab results. When we went live in 2007, all we offered was electronic delivery of lab results, pathology reports, radiology reports, and ADTs, or admission, discharge, and transfer reports. In 2010, we added transcribed reports, so that includes such things as discharge summaries, history physical, operative reports, and so forth. It was not until 2009 that discovery tools were added, which allowed a user to search for results of tests they had not personally ordered or query-based exchange. By that time, there was two years' worth of data aggregated in the hosted data center. So when providers did a search, there was actually something to find. This was the real birth of the community health record. Data from many disparate data senders is stored in a manner that allows it to be easily searchable and discoverable by properly privileged users of the network. The information in the community health record can be accessed by a user in several ways. The most desirable way is that data coming into the DIN community health record directly populates the ordering provider's electronic health record through an interface. 
In this setting, the user may not even actually be aware of the fact that they're getting their results through DIN because they stay in the workflow of their EHR until and unless they have to do a search for something that they didn't personally order. One of the services that DIN has provided is to certify interfaces between the DIN Community Health Record and various EHRs. We contract with the EHR vendors to create a single interface to DIN, across which all result types from all data senders will flow. And the contract specifies that once we've certified that interface, the vendor must offer it at a steeply discounted rate to all users of that EHR in Delaware. And we currently have certified interfaces to 13 different EHRs, and we have others that are in varying stages of beta testing and contracting. The second way that information in the community health record can reach a provider is through the auto print function. The practice must have the DIN utility installed on a computer or server, which is always on and connected to the internet. And based on configuration settings, which the practice chooses, results are queued up to print on a designated network printer at designated times and in the order that the practice designates. So this allows them to capture some administrative efficiencies and allows them to provide value even for practices that are still using a paper record system. The third way to receive results from the community health record is in a clinical inbox accessed through a web portal called ProAccess. Much like an email inbox, the results of tests the provider has ordered are sent to their electronic clinical inbox and when they log into ProAccess, that is their initial point of entry. Of note, ProAccess is also the tool used to search for unknown data on a known patient or to search for data on a previously unknown patient. It should also be mentioned that clinical data in the community health record can be delivered into a personal health record which the patient controls, with the meaningful use stage two requirement that at least 10% of a provider's patients must actually view their data online and download or transmit it. We do expect that adoption of this functionality is going to increase over time. This slide illustrates the growth and adoption of DIN. Our denominator for this slide is our best estimate of the number of providers in Delaware who place orders and would therefore expect to receive their results electronically. By the end of 2012, calendar year 2012, we were up to 98% adoption. And that's probably steady state, considering that there's always providers entering practice and leaving practice. I would also um, point out that our largest year-to-year -year jump in adoption was between 2008 and 2009. And interestingly, that represents the time when we introduced the query tools that allow a provider to query the community health record for previously unknown results. And this illustrates the very obvious truth that when they perceive value in the tool, it definitely drives adoption. This slide illustrates current membership in DIN as of May 2013. I'm very proud to say that participation in DIN is and always has been completely voluntary. This growth has occurred because of a clear and compelling value proposition. We've had very strong community support and lots of principled persuasion to draw in later adopters, but no one has ever been forced against their will to join DIN. As a matter of fact, we've had several out-of-state labs and a Maryland hospital near the southern Delaware border who have come to us requesting to join DIN because of the value they see in participating. We've also entered an agreement with the Maryland State HIE to exchange ADTs on residents of our own state who've been seen in a hospital in the other state. 
We're very focused on the continuum of care and closing gaps in the continuum of care. And in 2012, we were successful in enrolling all of Delaware's skilled nursing facilities in DIN, and we're now actually up to 80% of the assisted living facilities, along with a small number of home health and hospice organizations participating. The benefits listed on this slide are as of November 2011, looked at the period from 2009 when we introduced query tools to, to, to 2011, and we are currently in the process of updating this for the period of 2011 to 2013. So I hope that within um, a few months we will actually be able to provide updates to this with even more exciting <laughs> benefits to document. Uh, the data senders in DIN saved over $2 million in the cost of results delivery over that two-year period by having DIN deliver the results electronically. Now, the data senders only get that savings if they are using DIN to deliver results instead of, not in addition to, the ways that they previously did so. And so, if um, one of our key business metrics is our sign-off rate. When a practice signs off, they are agreeing to accept DIN as the report of record and shut off all other methods of results delivery. Our sign-off rate is now at 78%. So that's considerably higher than it was in November of 2011 when, uh, when this result was obtained. And so I think that as we update this uh, toward the end of 2013, we're going to see that the savings to the data senders is dramatically larger. The providers and practices with an EHR also get a significant savings from the steeply discounted cost of the interface to DIN, because a single interface can get them all result types from all data senders. Uh, and that one interface is offered at markedly lower than usual market rates. Each practice with an interface to DIN can save anywhere from $18,500 to $28,500 in the cost of their um, EHR uh, interfaces. Now, one of the presumptive benefits of a longitudinal record is that it allows you to avoid unnecessary repetition of tests. DIN has actually seen a 30 to 33 percent reduction in the ratio of high-cost labs and radiology studies to unique patients in the database over the two-year period from 2009 to 2011, and that rate appears to be continuing to drop. Because the cost savings to the health plans, or besides the, uh, the savings to the health plans, there's also a very real reduction of risk exposure for the patients in avoiding unnecessary radiation, as well as avoiding lost work time and out-of-pocket co-pays that go with uh, uh, redundant testing. So uh, both payers and, uh, and patients get a benefit from that reduction in redundant testing. Public health has seen improved efficiency and timeliness of receiving required results or required reporting to them. And uh, we do have many patient stories of benefits that they've received, but of course it's harder to get uh, population level metrics uh, in that setting. So we have a lot of stories, uh, but no metrics. Um, summing up the current services that DIN offers, uh, we still offer our results delivery and discovery tools uh, that, com that comprise the community health record. The community health record is our core service, and it will always be the heart and soul of what DIN offers. Uh, we also support the public health reporting requirements of meaningful use, and I'm happy to say that we had started work on that even before the, the high tech and meaningful use came along. And so uh, we've already discussed our public health reporting and the steeply discounted uh, EHR interfaces, so I won't belabor that further. This has been a very busy year for us in terms of development of new services. 
Meaningful use is creating a demand for exchange services well beyond simple electronic results delivery. And because DEN is already the trusted provider of information exchange in Delaware, we find that the providers and hospitals are naturally looking to DEN to provide solutions for the meaningful use interoperability requirements. We're currently developing an event notification system, which will allow us to notify providers and health plans when one of their patients has been discharged from the hospital or emergency department. So this will promote continuity of care, early follow-up and case management, and it will allow providers to bill under the new E&M codes for care transition management. We're working with several EHR vendors to be able to query as well as update the state immunization registry from within the user's EHR. We're conducting a pilot with two of our hospitals to enable the end user to click on a link in the radiology report that they already received through DIN and be taken to the actual image. And this supports one of the meaningful use stage two menu objectives. We're working on tools to enable the patient to receive updates of their chart in the community health record on their mobile device, as well as to engage in secure messaging with their provider. We expect to become an exchange partner on eHealth Exchange just as soon as our vendor successfully completes confirmation testing of the technology. This will allow us to exchange data with federal partners such as the VA, Department of Defense, and Social Security Administration, as well as with other HIEs. We're working with public health to integrate the newborn screening registry into the community health record, and we're working on a link inside ProAccess to the Delaware Prescription Monitoring Program. Um, that is actually in testing right now and should go live within a matter of a couple of weeks. We're in pilot testing with several practices to incorporate continuity of care documents into the community health record, and we're very excited about that because it will be our first opportunity of incorporating ambulatory practice level data into the community health record. Our long-term vision for DIN is a very expansive one. The value in the community health record is greatest when all the patients are in it, all of their data is in it, all of the healthcare community is using it. For all practical purposes, we have all Delaware citizens and all Delaware providers in. We are still looking for ways to add other data types that would add even more to the value of the community health record. And we're beginning to explore the potential to layer on analytic tools that will allow the data to be used for more than just point of care clinical decisions. There are technology, privacy and security, consent, data use agreements, and legal issues that all have to be dealt with, but these tools will be critical assets in the formation of accountable care organizations and patient-centered medical homes in Delaware. By any measure, DIN is a mature, highly successful state HIE, and this slide encapsulates some of the lessons learned, things that I believe we did right. Consensus building is slow, but it is essential if you're going to make progress uh, with business competitors. Start with those who are willing to work with you. Don't wait until everybody is, uh, is ready to jump in. Find what your market values and will use and do that extremely well. One of the things that we did in DEN, and I do believe this was a good decision, was we started with a small set of functionality that we knew our community would value, and we've used that to drive adoption and utilization. And now as we add new functionality, we've already got a built-in echo chamber of people who are accustomed to, to using DEN. I would also say it's important to provide value for everyone, not just the technology elite. You need to measure the value of what you're doing because that's what's going to persuade the late adopters to come in, and success begets success. Finally, there are barriers that have to be addressed and overcome. Technology issues are not trivial. You should get a good consultant, get strong technical input from all of the organizations that are committed to the effort. Trust is an issue. 
data senders must decide not to compete on the basis of the data. Providers must decide whether they are going to trust all of the data in the community health record or trust it all equally, and whether they trust the patient matching algorithms. Patients have to decide whether they trust that the privacy and security of the system gives them adequate protection. There's a natural reluctance to change. Some people just prefer the devil they know. There will always be early adopters and late adopters. Early adopters tend to be more fault tolerant than later adopters. At this stage of DIN's adoption curve, our users expect us to be just as reliable and available as electricity. Meet your users where they are, not where you wish they were. There's always going to be a mix of the tech savvy and the tech averse, sometimes within the same organization. And finally, a major issue that must be addressed by a state HIE or other public HIE whose members are business competitors is the business model for the HIE. What is the fair way to distribute the costs of providing the HIE services across all of those who receive value for the services? The HIE does have to be viewed as a business with a revenue stream to support every service offered. And I'll just conclude by saying, if it were easy, anybody could do it. <laughs> um, so I'll turn it back over now to Jerry uh, to introduce our next speaker. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Lee, for an excellent presentation. Before I introduce our next speaker, let me uh, remind the listeners to send in questions that you may have, that there's a question and answer period at the end. Um, so next we'll hear from Jennifer Fritz, who will discuss Minnesota's approach to the HIE. Jennifer is the Deputy Director from the Office of Health Information Technology at the Minnesota Department of Health. Ms. Fritz is responsible for the direction of Minnesota eHealth programs including Minnesota eHealth Initiative, Minnesota's Health Information Exchange Oversight Program, Minnesota's State Health Information Exchange Cooperative Agreement, and activities related to privacy and security, health informatics, and data standards. Prior to serving as Deputy Director, she served as Program Manager on the state's Health Information Exchange activities with responsibilities for developing and implementing Minnesota's strategic plan for health information exchange. Jennifer? Great. Thank you, Jerry. Well, I'm going to share a slightly different perspective than Jan, really one that is um, coming from a state that sees multiple health information exchange entities and acts as more of a role of government oversight. First, I'm going to start with a little bit of Minnesota history. Um, Thinking about eHealth and Health Information Exchange in Minnesota, Minnesota first established its eHealth initiative in 2004, which legislatively chartered an advisory committee to make recommendations on eHealth to the Commissioner of Health. And as a result, Minnesota has really taken a little more of a policy-oriented approach to eHealth and Health Information Exchange over the years. For example, recently Minnesota's privacy laws were updated to enable electronic exchange of information, and this is pre-HITECH. Still, Minnesota actually has a, a much stricter privacy requirement than most states. Thinking about uh, post-HITECH, as most of you know, HITECH passed in 2009, and in response to ONC's requirements for health information exchange governance, Minnesota adopted a market-based approach to health information exchange and passed a law requiring all entities providing HIE services in the state to get certified. That's uh, really our um, HIE oversight law, which was passed in 2010. And as of May of 2013, Minnesota has four state-certified HIE service providers uh, that are uh, currently operating in the state, and we have other entities that are exploring uh, uh, whether or not they should be certified as well. Although it was passed prior to the High Tech Act, Minnesota um, adopted a, an e-prescribing mandate requiring e-prescribing by 2011, and then also a mandate for interoperable electronic health records by 2015. The 2015 mandate is significant because it includes all types of healthcare providers, including providers not eligible for meaningful use. And the mandate also has the health information exchange component requiring providers to connect to a state certified HIE service provider in Minnesota. So now I'm going to talk just a little bit about the state certification uh, role and oversight. Um, essentially, that, uh, that, that State certification establishes oversight by the Commissioner of Health to protect the public in interest on matters pertaining to health information exchange. And so our office at the Department of Health oversees that process. It requires state certification of, 
of authority to operate um, two types of entities in the state. One is a health information or organization, and the other type is a health data intermediary. And really what it does is it allows um, market-based um, sort of innovation and, and approach for the provision of HIE services in Minnesota. So what we see is that we have multiple HIE service providers um, operating in the state and then that they must be certified in order to uh, operate in the state. So here's a, a pictorial view of what HIE looks like in Minnesota. Uh, on this slide you can see what it looks like with one HIO, which is kind of the more robust type of HIE entity operating in the state. There's statewide HIE by connecting to Minnesota providers, healthcare providers, and then there's also connectivity to the nationwide eHealth exchange. The next slide here uh, shows what it looks like when you have multiple entities operating in the state. So really um, the challenge that we see in Minnesota is the interoperability requirements between them. So you have HIO1 and HIO2, just as an um, example. What we've done to address the interoperability requirements in Minnesota is what we call a statewide shared services. And that's really uh, services that are, um, are utilized by HIE service providers that are competitors to one another uh, to be able to share information about the providers across the, uh, across the state. And so in this picture you see the statewide shared services as sort of the interoperability component between them and then you see multiple HIE um, service providers in the picture, so HIO1, HIO2, and then you also see the health data intermediaries, also with connectivity to the, the nationwide um, eHealth exchange. So there's some pros and cons to a market-based approach to health information exchange. On the one hand, um, it does allow for more private sector investments and innovation. So for example, in Minnesota, we really haven't had to invest uh, significantly in the HIE infrastructure. Um, from a government standpoint. It allows for um, more maybe adaptability to changes in technology trends or requirements. So for example, with meaningful use changes, um, it allows for that adaptability. And then it also gives providers multiple options because maybe they have different needs um, depending on, on what, their, um, what their HIE needs are. On the other hand, it can also create a little bit more confusion in the marketplace. Um, and as, as I mentioned, it does create uh, challenges around interoperability because when you have multiple entities, you want to make sure that, um, that the information can flow across, across the uh, sort of network of HIE service providers. And then from our perspective in a government role, there's also many aspects to um, monitor. So for example, we're, we're constantly having to monitor the technology trends, various policy and legal changes both nationally and within the state. Um, to make sure that we're implementing our oversight program appropriately. This next slide represents um, several different types of settings that we think are important for health information exchange. And in this, in this case, just as an example, these are actually the settings that are required to have an interoperable electronic health record by 2015 in Minnesota. So when we think about accountable care, and HIE, I think these are, these are um, settings that are important to consider uh, when, when uh, considering uh, marketing or building any type of HIE infrastructure. Next I want to talk a little bit about the future of HIE in Minnesota. Um, we know that there are multiple entities uh, providing HIE services in the state. And so, as I mentioned, interoperability continues to be a big need for us and we'll be continuing to implement the statewide shared services to support our ongoing interoperability needs. Secondly, we know there are more entities out there providing HIE services and we'll be working to continue to certify those entities to make sure that they go through the right uh, process. And we've seen that the HIE market can change quickly and it requires constant monitoring of national activities in order to stay current. We also know that Minnesota's HA oversight law at some point will probably need to be updated to uh, more accurately reflect the current HAE marketplace as it, has, as it has changed in the last few years. The next slide, uh, continuing on the future of HIE in Minnesota, we know that because of having multiple entities providing HIE services and potentially the, um, the type of confusion that it can create by providers in the marketplace, um, we will want to continue uh, focusing on providing provider education on the HIE options. So for example, helping them explore what HIE solution might, might best suit their needs. 
We know that we'll be focusing on privacy and security to really help to increase the adoption of HIE, which currently privacy and security is um, sort of a barrier to HIE adoption in Minnesota. And then also work on interstate and national connectivity to other HIEs. And then we're seeing HIE service providers starting to move from more basic HIE to what I consider more advanced, which is really um, you know, moving more towards analytics, more, to more towards the types the type of HIE that's needed for accountable care. Now I want to just reflect a little bit on the lessons learned from Delaware. And first, I really want to commend um, Delaware's achievements that they've made in HIE. It sounds like they've made remarkable progress, both in terms of um, HIE adoption by providers, as well as actually demonstrating outcomes. First, I want to comment on, on the comment about consensus. We have seen that achieving consensus can be a lot of work, but it's really the key for sustainability. And in Minnesota, we found this to be true in regard to shared services, where natural HIE competitors have come together to reach consensus regarding technical aspects of shared services. And then they've also worked together on a policy and governance framework, as well as sustainability plans for how, how they're going to sustain those services together. We've also found it's helpful to start with those motivated to do HIE. In Minnesota, the providers that we've seen more enthusiastic regarding HIE have actually been providers not eligible for meaningful use. So in our, in our case, we've actually seen quite a bit more interest from providers such as local public health and long-term care. We've created programs for the broad continuum of providers to encourage those ready and interested in HIE to participate. And because there will be a range of providers interested in HIE, those with and without certified EHR technology, it's important that HIE service providers anticipate the range of HIE needs from more basic needs to more advanced. And those options need to create value based on business needs. We're seeing, um, especially with the evolving models of healthcare, for example, accountable care, that this is really important. Coincidentally, we've also found that Minnesota is a little bit harder. Um, this is a little bit harder to do in Minnesota when there's a market-based approach because there is more competition um, in the marketplace. The next slide is really just a reflection on some of uh, Delaware's barriers. So in Minnesota, we've also found that it's critical to monitor emerging trends in technology and adapt uh, the HIE solutions based on changes in medical practice. The types of HIE services that were being offered in Minnesota only three years ago are much different today. Uh, and for example, it's really because of accountable care and the need for more advanced data analytics um, and HIE solutions resulting from that. We've also found that scalable trust, and for example, the work that national groups like Direct Trust are working on is foundational for expanding HIE beyond just a community. And finally, Jan's comment about the natural reluctance to change, I think, is true in Minnesota as well. We hear from providers that they want HIE solutions that are directly in their workflow and at the point of care in order to create value and willingness to change the way they're doing um, care just through HIE. The next slide continues on talking about um, Delaware's barriers and reflecting in Minnesota. We believe that there, there are early, um, that early adopters can be great champions for HIE to others, although in Minnesota's experience, it's difficult to get those early adopters to make those investments, especially if there isn't a critical mass exchanging. So that's actually one, been one of our challenges in Minnesota. We've found that um, thinking of the range of providers that want to participate in HIE, that meeting them where they are in terms of HIE readiness and capabilities is a first start to getting provider adoption of HIE. Again, in Minnesota, the providers that have had a higher demand for HIE have actually been the providers not even eligible for meaningful use. But on the other hand, some of those providers might be the types of providers that are, are needed for accountable care. And then finally, um, a comment about the business model for HIE uh, where members or providers or business competitors, we think about the goals of accountable care and the responsibilities that go with it, much more of a collaborative model that will be needed in order to achieve those outcomes of increased quality of care and lower healthcare costs. A couple of final observations um, about the HIE marketplace and accountable care. We know that there are going to be continuing to be many types of entities providing HIE services. For example, stage two meaningful use really kind of fosters more of a market-based approach to HIE. 
the challenge we see will be finding ways to create interoperability between these entities across communities statewide and even across state borders. We've seen with the evolution from more basic HIE to more advanced HIE that sustainable HIE service providers really need to be able to offer value-based services. And that many times that means going above and beyond the basic um, HIE services and also the basic requirements for meaningful use. We've experienced in Minnesota a lag in provider adoption of HIE. We think actually it might be due to the somewhat lower HIE requirements for meaningful use, at least for stage one. But we think that that will be increasing with stage two and then also as the demand for accountable care increases. And then finally, we think it's also important to consider the range of settings interested in HIE, especially in an accountable care model. HIE service providers will need to adapt their offerings and how they market their services with this in mind. So thank you, and now I'll turn it back over to Jerry. Thank you, Jan, that was excellent. So we've had a, a number of questions come in. Um, and the first one is on this exact point. It's uh, about accountable care organizations and the relationship. So recognizing that the state HIE governance structure in Delaware and Minnesota are very different, and that Delaware does not yet have accountable care organizations, what do each of you see as the role of the HIEs in each of your states, if any, in supporting ACOs in the future? Are the HIE entities in your states working with HCO administrators or those interested in forming ACOs to discuss data exchange and connectivity? And why don't we start with Jan and then go yeah. to Jennifer. I'll be glad to. Uh, so in Delaware, we do not yet have any ACOs. We do have uh, a couple of different hospitals that are contemplating moving in that direction and are sort of lining up their, um, their, their resources and their plans to do so. I will tell you that each of them sees DEN as being absolutely critical to their ability to do that. We're also working, as many other states are, with the state innovation models planning grant. And uh, it's, you know, with Delaware being a small state, uh, DEN is a major uh, existing IT resource that everybody believes should be leveraged for any additional HIT needs uh, to support new models of, of care delivery and payment. And so uh, we, we are very busy right now doing the planning around what would it take to add in the kind of actuarial and analytic tools that would be needed to support these new models of, of care delivery and payment. And there's every expectation that we will leverage the tools that DIN already has, <coughs> which um, includes identity matching tools. It's not just the data in the system that is a valuable resource. It's the identity matching tools. It's provider registries. It's patient registries that already exist. Um, so, yes, I think that we are very much going to be involved in um, the move ahead to, to forming ACOs. Thank you, Jan. And uh, Jennifer, can you speak to this a little bit more? I know you covered some of this in your slides. Can you speak a little bit more to the uh, uh, sure. and account yeah. care organizations? Yes, absolutely. So in Minnesota, we definitely see alignment between HIE and ACOs. In Minnesota, we currently have three of the pioneer ACOs uh, in the state. We also have our uh, state Medicaid agency has been, um, I'm not sure what the word is, funding or developing sort of an ACO type of model um, for um, across the state with, with Medicaid uh, activities. And then we're also one of the uh, state innovation model uh, testing states. So we're going to be working on developing what we're calling the Minnesota Accountable Health Model. So there will be a, a fair amount of ACO activity happening in the state. And through uh, our state certification process, we do see that that plays a role. So for example, we anticipate that the HIE uh, um, entities that are providing those services to the a ACO uh, organizations or ACO communities, we anticipate that they will at some point need to be certified. Um, we are um, hearing interest right now from the community about that, and so we, we expect that, the, that those players will um, be expanding our HIE marketplace in Minnesota. Well, uh, thank you both. 
And, um, and so the second question, and this is also to both of you, is around using your HIE um, as a registry. And the specific question is whether it's being used to collect HEDIS data. But you could speak to it more broadly as a registry to create a denominator, and the denominator could be the HEDIS population, and then the numerator of how many people pass. Um, uh, and, th and that's broad enough, but there is a second part of it, which has to do with consumer reminders for preventive care. So, uh, so first, the registry function, uh, particularly uh, used to collect HEDIS data, data for HEDIS purposes, and then reminders and alerts. And Jennifer, let's start with you. Sure. So both of those uh, services, I would say, are services that we would consider valuable in Minnesota. I don't know that any of the service providers that are currently certified offer either of those services. Um, I know that there's been some interest around the quality measures, um, and I think there's some exploration there. In terms of the consumer-based reminders, I'm actually not aware of anyone uh, working on that currently, although I wouldn't be at all surprised if that doesn't emerge uh, in, the near, in the near future. Okay, uh, thank you. That's that's good. Um, Jan, do you want to uh, tackle this question now? Sure. Um, we, we are not currently a registry for HEDIS because we're not getting health plan level data yet. But again, I would say that the, the basic underlying infrastructure of DIN puts us in a position to, uh, if anyone is going to do that statewide, it's going to be DIN. Uh, because, again, we already have the, the matching tools, the algorithms in place, and so forth, and it would be a relatively low lift to leverage the functionality and the technology that we already have to layer on those services. So that's some of the discussions that are taking place right now uh, with our uh, state innovation models planning. Um, as for the, let's see, what was the second piece of that? Uh, it had to do with alerts or reminders? Alerts, yes. Um, we are working on an alert function for health plans and providers. The patient engagement uh, tools that we're in the process of implementing right now are really intended not so much to push out reminders of when things are due, because that's not really um, that's not really information that DIN necessarily has available because I mentioned we're, we're not currently getting a lot of input from the ambulatory practices. Now, if that changes and we have the data sources, then, then there's certainly a lot more we can do with it. But what we do expect to provide to consumers is the ability to – Anytime new data comes into the community health record, no matter who the data sender is, as new data comes into DIN, we are going to be able to push that right out to the patient so that they are immediately aware of, of um, the fact that new data has come in and uh, they may wish to engage with their providers around a discussion of those results. Thank you. Um, so we have a number of other questions, but I believe we're out of time. So I thank you both for a really interesting presentation. I've enjoyed moderating it, and I'll turn it back to Judy Consalvo. Um, thank you, Jerry. Thank you very much. Um, and I want to thank uh, our presenters as well as our audience. Um, please remember to complete the web event evaluation. Uh, it helps us to improve our offerings. and future events. And for more information on the Delaware Health Information Network, we included a hyperlink on this slide to the profile on the ARC Healthcare Innovations Exchange. If you have some questions, uh, you, it, there's um, a comment section which you can uh, direct your questions to on that particular profile. So we invite you to visit our website, follow us on Twitter for all the latest developments, you can also contact us anytime at info at innovations.arc.gov. And uh, watch out in the near future. The um, slides and the transcript from today's presentation will be posted. And again, we welcome your questions and to contact us at any time. Thank you again for joining us.